Here goes nothing. Hey, it spins! It spins! Hi there everyone. In this video, we are going to be making the world's most expensive 2207 motor by rewinding a motor with this. This is solid silver enameled wire. And along the way, we're going to be learning heaps about what makes silver such a conductive metal, how we can wind and rewind our motors to change the KV or repair a damaged winding, and we're going to be looking at what performance benefit silver wire could give an FPV motor if we were willing to spend the money to do it. It's a lot to cover in one video, so let's not waste any more time. Let's dive right into it. All right, so here we have three identical motors. At the moment, they're all wound with silver plated copper wire, but I want to see what the difference is between silver plated copper, ordinary pure copper wire, and 100% solid sterling silver wire. So what we're going to be doing is unwinding these two motors and then rewinding them with the ordinary and the solid silver wire, and then testing them on the thrust stand and seeing how they perform. So why use solid silver wire? Why not gold? Well, it turns out that silver is the most conductive metal. It's more conductive than copper and more conductive than gold. And the reasons for that are absolutely fascinating. In fact, I was going to include a whole technical deep dive in this video as to exactly what makes silver so conductive, but it just ended up being far too long. So that's going to be in another video, which I'm going to be uploading in the next few days. So make sure you're subscribed and hit that notification bell so you don't miss that video the moment it becomes available. Before we can rewind a motor, first we have to unwind one. And this procedure isn't too tricky, but there are some things we can do to make it easier for ourselves. The first thing is to label all of the coils numbers 1 through 12 so that when we're rewinding the motor, we know which was coil 1, 2, 3. Now, it doesn't matter which coil you choose as coil 1. Um, you can just pick any coil. But the important thing is to number them all the way around. The second thing we can do is to label how many turns were on each coil. And I do that simply by counting the number of wires that go over the top of each coil and then labeling that on the motor as well. Once we've done that labeling, we can start to unwind the motor. Firstly, we'll cut the insulation between the three motor wires and then cut off those three motor wires really close to the motor so that we can get at the ends of the coils. Once we can get the end of the coils, I like to use a really long nose pair of pliers just to pull the wire off the motor and just go one coil at a time. It's sometimes easier to cut the coil on top of the motor um, or cut the coil underneath the motor. It doesn't really matter. We're not going to be reusing any of this wire. Um, it's not going to be possible to reuse it. So just cut it wherever is easiest and then pull those coils off. Within a few minutes, you're going to have a bare motor stator with all the wire removed. And at that point, it can be useful just to give it a bit of a clean or a wash. I found when I unwound the motor, it had loads of dust on it. So um, just giving that a quick uh, rinse under the tap or something to wash all that dust off really helped me. Once we have a blank motor core, we can look to rewind the motor. But before we start that, First, we should take a look at a winding diagram to see how these 2207 motors are wound. We have a choice of two different winding schemes for our 12N14P motors that we use in FPV. And you might find one or other easier depending on your preferences. The schema on the left is, I think, easier to understand and easier to wind. The schema on the right is more complicated to wind, but then easier to terminate, easier to make the connections to. So I'm going to talk you through both schema, and then you can pick whichever one you want to use. This diagram on the left shows three key pieces of information that we need to be aware of. Firstly, the order in which we're winding coils. So let's look at the red phase, phase A. Firstly, we're going to come in here at the start of A and wind coil one. Then we're going to go and wind coil two. Then we're going to come round and wind coil seven and coil eight. So the order in which we wind coils is important. The second piece of information is the direction in which we wind each coil. Some coils are going to be wound clockwise and some coils are going to be wound counterclockwise. So you can just look at the diagram to see whether a coil is going to be wound clockwise, CW, or counterclockwise, CCW. 
The final key piece of information is which wires we're going to be connecting together at the end. So in this diagram, you can see we're going to be connecting coil 1 and coil 12 together with this red blob. Then we're going to be connecting coil 3 and coil 8 together with this blue blob. And finally, we're going to be connecting coil 10 and coil 5 together with this green blob. I've also written out the order of winding coils here. You can see we go 1, 2, 7, 8, 3, 4, 9, 10, and 5, 6, 11, 12 with the coils to be connected together shown in the same color. So we're connecting 1 to 12, 3 to 8, and 5 to 10. This information is everything we need to wind a coil using this schema. This second schema, as I said before, is a little trickier to wind, but terminating the coils becomes a bit easier. What we're going to be doing is changing the order that we wind the middle phase, so the blue phase. And what that's going to allow us to do is make sure that the wires that come out next to each other are the ones that we need to connect together. And here again we're doing 1, 2, 7, 8 with the first phase, and then the second phase is a bit different. Rather than 3, 4, 9, 10, we're doing 9, 10, 3, 4, so doing them in a different order. And then the final phase is the same, 5, 6, 11, 12. The upshot of this is that because the wires that we need to connect together come from coils that are next to each other, it's much easier to twist those wires together, solder them to the motor wires. And as far as I can tell, all the mechanically wound motors that you're gonna buy in FPV will use this second winding scheme because it's easier to terminate the wires. Once we have a winding diagram that shows the order in which we need to wind the coils and the direction in which each coil needs to be wound, we can start to rewind the motor. Now, I didn't find that rewinding the motor was that difficult because I had numbered all of the coils with a Sharpie before I started. I knew how many turns I had to put on each coil and I had the winding diagram to show me which direction and which order to wind the coils in. There were a couple of things that I found a little bit fiddly about winding this motor. The first is just trying to get the coils to lie neatly and the coils to move down deep into the slot so that I can get the full seven turns I needed to get on each coil in the first layer. That was pretty tricky. The coils were quite springy and they wanted to kind of move out of the motor unless I kept pushing them back in with a fingernail. It did help to keep some tension on the wire as I was winding to try and make sure that the coils were reasonably tight. But I didn't want to make them too tight because I needed to be able to slide them down into the motor to make room for the turns that I was putting on at the end. So there was definitely a balance to strike there. The second thing that I found useful was leaving plenty of wire coming out of the start and end of each phase to make it easier to terminate later, to make it easier to twist the wires together as well. So it would definitely advise leaving a nice length of wire. And the final thing is that rewinding these motors does take quite a bit of time and my fingers did get pretty tired and crampy towards the end of rewinding just one motor. So I'm not sure that I would recommend rewinding motors to repair them versus just buying a replacement motor. I think for most people just spending another you know, $15 on a new motor that you know is going to work is probably going to be a bit easier than spending money on copper wire and then rewinding the motor by hand. The only reason that I can think to rewind a motor by hand is if you want to achieve either a very high or a very low KV, well outside the range that you can buy, and then it might be worth rewinding it by hand. But at the end of the day, even though I paid a lot of attention and care with rewinding this motor, I'm still not sure that I got the wind as good as a store-bought motor that's been wound by a machine. Once we have the motor fully rewound, the only thing left to do is to twist together the phases that should be connected, again referring to the winding diagram, and then to solder the motor wires back on to the ends of the coil phases. And I was fortunate here that I was using enameled wire that was solderable, so I could use my soldering iron just to burn through the enamel coating and make the joint. This type of enamel is useful for just winding motors for testing purposes, I think, but I wouldn't probably use this type of wire for winding motors that I was going to fly with because I'd want to use a much higher temperature enamel and those are not solderable, which means that I'd need to have some pretty aggressive chemistry to dip the ends of the wires in to strip off that enamel before I could solder to it. 
And that's the sort of thing that obviously they have available to them in mass production when we're making motors. But it's not something that I would want to use just on my bench at home because those chemicals are pretty nasty. So I picked the solderable enamel wire um, so that I could just solder straight through it. Once I finished terminating the hand wound copper motor, all that remained was to repeat all of the same steps with the solid silver wire. Following the winding diagram, winding all the coils, twisting them together, terminating them, and finally adding a bit of heat shrink just to prevent the risk of anything shorting out and getting the motors ready to be put on test. All right, so now we have our three motors ready to test. Hand wound with copper wire, hand wound with solid silver wire, and machine wound with silver plated copper wire. At this point, I have no idea if my hand wound motors are even gonna spin, let alone do anything that I can actually test. So it's time to put them on the thrust test stand and see how they perform. All right, so now it's time to see if my handmade motor will spin. And I think it looks pretty good. This is the copper one, obviously. I managed to kind of get it all together um, and bound up. So let's screw it onto the thrust test stand and see how it performs. Here goes nothing. Hey, it spins! It spins! Now the moment we've all been waiting for. It's time to put the silver motor on the thrust stand. And I'm actually really happy with how this has turned out. I mean, I don't know if it works yet, so this is purely from an aesthetic perspective, but you can see the blue coils through the top of the motor and lovely blue shiny coils on the bottom of the motor. And then I've gone and ruined it with the yellow heat shrink, but uh, so what? I'm really, really pleased with how this has turned out. Now it's time to get it on the test stand and see if it'll spin. And uh, even more than that, see if we can get some test numbers out of it. All right, so the beeping is a good sign, but will it turn? Oh, come on. Yeah! Oh, sweet! So with all the motors spinning, let's take a look at the test results I was able to get before, well, I guess what inevitably happened next. One test that I was able to do on all three motors was measure their KV. And I've done a whole video on motor KV, which I'll link down in the video description, which explains where it all comes from. But the short summary is that KV is really a measure of the number of turns on the coils and how the magnetic field in the rotor interacts with the coils in the stator. Because we're using the same rotor for all of these tests, and we have exactly the same number of turns on every coil, because I made sure to measure that very carefully, the only difference between these three motors is in the material that the coils are made out of and how they're wound. The fact that we see a clear relationship between the material used for the winding and the KV suggests that using a more conductive metal for the winding does enable the magnetic field in the rotor to interact more strongly with the electrical field being generated in the windings. And I think this is the strongest evidence that I have that changing the winding material does actually make a difference to how the motor performs from a magnetic and electrical perspective. I was also able to measure the thrust, the torque and the responsiveness of at least the hand wound copper motor and the silver plated motor. And what I found was that in terms of top end thrust, no difference. Both the copper and the silver plated copper motor performed identically in terms of top end power. When it came to torque, the silver plated motor was able to generate more torque and it also had better responsiveness. So that torque was able to convert to a shorter time to accelerate the prop. The main difference between the copper motor and the silver plated motor that I found was just in efficiency. The copper hand wound motor that I made was around 3% less efficient than the mechanically wound silver plated motor. And some of that may come down to the conductivity of the windings, and some of that may come down to the fact that my coils weren't able to be as neat and tight as the ones made by the machine. 
Although it's not possible to draw firm conclusions from this testing because there are just too many variables in hand winding a motor, from all the testing that I've done so far on mechanically wound copper and silver plated copper motors, what I can say is that there probably is a small difference between copper windings and silver plated copper windings. But that difference is only going to be a few percentage points and other factors like how neat the windings are, how well the motor is able to stay cool and the strength of the magnets in the rotor are probably much more impactful than whether a motor has silver plated windings or not. So let's address the elephant in the room. What happened to the world's most expensive 2207 motor? Well, after I measured the KV, I put the motor on the thrust stand for the flywheel dyno test. Now, this is not the most aggressive test that I do. That would be the prop ramp up to 100% throttle. With the flywheel dyno test, I only use 50% throttle, but we are accelerating a dead load up to 20,000 RPM. And so the motor does draw a lot of current. Normally a motor will get moderately hot during this test, but won't smoke. And the copper hand wound motor didn't smoke. So I was feeling pretty confident, but the moment I let rip with the flywheel dyno test with my silver motor, um, the magic smoke came out and the motor was no more. All I can think is that there was some damage to the enamel coating on the wire somewhere within the windings and the motor shorted out, drew a huge amount of current and the heat just boiled off all the insulation off one of the phases. And that was it, the motor was no more. I was gonna rewind that phase and try again, but there was so much heat that it actually damaged all of the surrounding phases as well. So uh, everything was shorted out and there was just no recovery. But you know, that motor's gonna join a long line of motors and ESCs and VTXs and flight controllers that have all died, all been killed by me in the pursuit of science for this channel. And I really appreciate all your support that allows me to keep making videos like this. If you wanna support more work like this, you like these videos, then I would really love it if you'd go and check out my Patreon. You can join from just a few dollars a month. You'll get access to my Discord server. You'll get sneak peeks of the projects I'm working on. You'll get access to more data from the testing that I'm doing, more data than's available on my website, at AOS Labs. And most of all, you'll be supporting more testing work on this channel going forward into the future. And coming up is gonna be battery testing. We're already more than halfway to the amount of money that we need to get this battery tester funded. So any donations that you can put towards that cause are only gonna accelerate all the testing that I'm able to do. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much for coming on the journey with me. I think that the journey here is so much more important than the destination. At least that's what I'm gonna tell myself to justify burning out a motor I spent four hours winding by hand. So thanks so much for your support. Uh, check out my Patreon, help me make more videos like this. And until next time, happy flying.